Nobody really thought I was a good guy before that, so. <laughs> it's not like he's not good at all. So there were ways that I could manipulate this situation in this case, all the related cases, and to my benefit and on my timeline by withholding information and giving information out. This is Israel Keys, a serial killer obsessed with control. I almost feel guilty. <laughs> Costing the taxpayers a lot of money to find us. <laughs> but this kept my mouth shut. <laughs> 2012, and an 18 year old teenager, Samantha Koenig, was on a late shift at the Common Grounds espresso stand in Anchorage, Alaska. She'd only worked there for around a month, but had become popular with the regular clientele. She had also been given responsibility of opening and closing the store which she took in her stride. It was one of those nights when she was working alone that the last customer she would ever see entered the coffee shop. Israel Keats, a 34-year-old seemingly average guy, was looking for the easiest place he could commit a crime. Yes, he was stalking places that would make the whole thing as easy as it could be so that he wouldn't get caught. That's how he found the Common Grounds espresso stand. What made Common Grounds his target is that it was open when the other stands were closed. He already had a cruise ticket to Mexico the following night so he could flee the crime scene that he had already prepared for in his home in Anchorage. At his house, he had two heaters and he placed a tarp on the floor to not leave any evidence behind. He was all prepared for the crime he would commit, or so it would seem. That night, Ezreal was listening to his radio traffic scanner. Just before 8 p.m., he learned about an incident in another part of the town. As police were distracted, this was his chance to get on the move. He put on a ski mask and went to the Common Grounds espresso stand that Samantha Koenig was working at that night. It was only Samantha on the late night shift. So he ordered an Americano and Samantha went ahead to prepare it as she usually does. But when she was ready to deliver his order, she was face to face with a handgun instead. A terrified Samantha was told to turn off the lights before Israel climbed inside the stand from the window. Samantha then told him her father would be there any minute to pick her up. At this point, he doesn't know about the security camera in the stand. He told Samantha to get on her knees. He tied her up. After hesitating, Israel gagged her and pushed her into his car. Samantha was told that she was gonna be held for ransom as she was placed in the passenger seat. Israel Keys took Samantha to his house in Nia Bay, Anchorage, Alaska, but he left something important behind. He forgets Samantha's phone in the stand and realizes this only after he reaches his house. He takes Samantha to the shed and ties her up. Then he goes back to the coffee shop retrieves the phone and returns to his house. He does all this unnoticed, but who was this creepy control obsessed guy? He was born in 1978 in Richmond, Utah. His parents were Mormon and he was homeschooled. He didn't have much chance to interact with his peers or didn't make any friends. Later on, the Keys family moved to Washington and started to attend the arc of a Christian identity church that encourages racist and anti-Semitic views. On the contrary to usual criminals, Israel Keys has nothing unresolved with his victim. He had absolutely no reason to choose the people he murdered. He didn't know the people he murdered. He was neither rejected nor denied by them. Well, the only reason the Courier case has even become an issue is because of me wanting to keep control of that situation before it became a situation. By now we know that psychopaths take pleasure out of belittling other people. This is Israel in the middle of his interrogation, surrounded by three criminology experts. His chin tilted slightly down and neck tilted to the side. He's underestimating all these experts, as if he's addressing the poor folk in Dostoevsky's first novel. His attitude is meant to shame, belittle, and bully the people around him. Police are no exception. Israel plays the cops just like a cat does with a mouse. Well, like I've said all along, my cooperation on other crimes is dependent on what's going on with the crimes that I'm already charged with. So. And I've said that all along. Quite comfortable in his seat like a C-level executive, Israel Keys comments on how his name will be used and will be commercialized in pop culture as if he's a landmark celebrity. Right, my concern, the problem is nowadays, uh, the more stuff my name is attached to, the more likely it is that somebody's gonna try to do some kind of stupid freaking TV special or, you know, you know how it is nowadays, like with all this true crime bull. 
that people are obsessed with, and that's the... Uh... Psychopaths to themselves are celebrities. Celebrities and wise people who are dying to be respected and acknowledged by other people. In this case, Israel Keyes is no different than the criminals we've covered, but he seems to have assured himself that he's at the top of the pyramid. But we have some sticky psychological notes about how he breaks into the subconscious of these three helpless detectives later on in the video, because his story gets more interesting. When he was 20, he joined the army and served at Fort Lewis, Fort Hood, and Egypt. He was famous for his heavy drinking in the army and his love for insane clown posse or ICP. At the age of 22, he was honorably discharged from the army, which was followed by his later claim of being an atheist. Perhaps the church visits he had with his family in his early age had a part to play in this. He later on admitted that he committed his first murder in 2001 during his time in Washington, next to his claim that he found the region he lived in boring. We still don't know the identity of his victim to this date. According to Israel Keyes, he also murdered and buried a couple near this area. Later on, he made a statement saying that he had committed not three, but four murders during his time living there. Israel seemed to have tried to rebuild his life for a while in Alaska, or it would seem so up until the night he caught Samantha off guard. In 2007, he moved to Anchorage, Alaska and founded Keyes Construction and started working as a contractor. You really would think that he's starting over. However, by that time, he had already committed dozens of murders and robberies. This would be the best time to mention his idol, Ted Bundy. That's why Israel kept traveling states wide to make sure no one was suspicious, because he was inspired and because he was a planner. He would plan his murders with excessive details beforehand and would take ultimate precautions to ensure he's not caught. He would book cruises and flights months in advance to him committing the crimes. But that's not all. While he was traveling around the country, he carried his murder bags, baskets filled with shovels, guns, and ammunition. Why would anyone carry around ammunition? And he himself refers to the baskets as kill kits. He spread these kill kits in remote locations throughout the states. Some of the items he would put in these kill kits were zip ties, ammunition, guns, silencers, duct tape, and Drano to accelerate human decomposition. He would hide them in parks and forests. In this case, Israel wanted to minimize the time he spent on killing. He wanted to be efficient, an efficient serial killer he was. One that always uses cash and kills outside the state he lives in. None of the detectives were able to get a statement about the exact number of Keyes' victims. Samantha Koenig is believed to be his last victim, but we know it's not the last crime he committed. Israel Keyes abducted Samantha from the coffee corner, stealing her car to take her to his house, where he didn't live alone. Israel Keyes had a small daughter and a girlfriend that he shared his house with. Even though they were at home, Israel tied Samantha up in a shed next to his house and told her he would kill her if she screamed. He then turned on the radio, turned up the volume, and left. He managed to do all this without no one noticing. He then returned and asked Samantha about her debit card, which then led him to break into her boyfriend's truck to get her card. His original plan was to ransom her and have the money into her account so he could withdraw it. However, he later on poured himself a glass of wine and returned to the shed where Samantha is all tied up. He physically violated her and then slowly strangled her to her very last breath. But that was not the end for Israel. He wrapped Samantha's body and stuffed her in a cabinet in a freezing shed. The next morning, he called a cab to get to the airport and he woke his daughter for school. He used the tickets he booked months ago to go on a cruise starting from New Orleans. He then drove to Texas by car. Then he robbed and burned a house followed by his robbery of a branch of the National Bank of Texas. That's my concern is that, you know, it could, it, something, if something else were to get out, and it, especially in a different area or something. His shoulders are not tense. He doesn't seem to need any self-pacifying behaviors because he doesn't feel any kind of pressure, anxiety, or remorse at all. He knows that he's in control. He feels in control. He's the one who has what they want what they need, the information about his victims, specifically how many. Then, uh, you know, and, and, and now there's the whole Nia Bay aspect of it now too, you know, it's like, my kids live in Nia Bay now and gossip is the, is the town pastime, so. No matter how brutal a serial killer he is, Israel Keys still seems to portray himself as a father who even if partially cares about his child. Experience says that one of the two personalities he carried to this day is a loving father, but we don't know how it all started or if he had a traumatic experience which led to this. It's also difficult to pinpoint by the means of his expression in introspection that he has schizophrenia. 
Although his choices imply that he is neurologically abnormal, a neurologically healthy person wouldn't go to all the trouble to place his weapons beforehand or know that they will commit a crime in a certain place or setting with whoever they encounter as the victim. Israel Keyes took it way too far. He returned from his trip and went straight to the shed where he was storing the corpse of Samantha. February 19th, Israel Keyes took Samantha's body from the cabinet and violated her, her frozen corpse. He put makeup on her face, sewed her eyes so they would look as they were healthily open, and took a photograph of her with a recent newspaper next to his ransom note to Samantha's family, where he asked for $30,000 if they wanted to see their daughter alive again. He texted Samantha's boyfriend, given the directions where he left his list of his demands. He also knew that Samantha Koenig's family was not wealthy enough to pay for her ransom. So Israel Keyes suggested the family arrange the money by some kind of crowdfunding. A few days later, he slipped Samantha's body and dumped her parts into the Matanuska Lake near Anchorage. The interrogation portion you're about to see will reveal the abnormality of his character. He plays the detectives just like a cat does with a mouse. He doesn't surrender. He keeps the act going, and this drives the detectives insane enough that they submit to Israel Keyes. In the following part of the interrogation, detectives are trying to uncover the exact location of the remains of Samantha. Meanwhile, Israel Keyes takes satisfaction out of teasing them by withholding information, which he knows gives him power. How long does a body last in a freshwater lake? I mean, because there's no critters that eat. It depends how bodies and it depends how lakes, right? Deep, I learned a lot. Because it depends on the deep, depends the temperature deep is, of the water. And if the body's contained in something. And it's not critters, it can be like bacteria yeah. or you know about Lake Crescent in Washington. Mm -hmm. How deep is it? I think that lake is five to seven hundred feet deep. They've really? never been to the bottom of it. There's people who have gone off that lake and they still haven't found it. Their cars are in it. And that's the lake. That's one of the lakes. Let's pause for a moment and evaluate the positionings of the detectives and Israel Keys. Look at this snapshot. Does this at all look like an interrogation to you? Forget that this is a police interrogation and just look at the snapshot. Let's spot the seven differences. We keep talking about how neurologically abnormal people tend to overestimate their intelligence, see themselves as more intelligent than other people. For psychopaths, intelligence would mean domination. In this case of Israel Keyes, you just saw his satisfaction of keeping the knowledge to himself. This is what makes him powerful. He's the only one who knows, and this is what gives him power. The idea is simply this, submit to me and practice what I preach. Though the picture shouldn't give you the wrong idea because this is not about the regular classroom environment of youngsters, rather how three adults, AKA detectives, are made to submit into his knowledge. Believe me, none of the detectives are actually conscious that this is what's going on here so much that they themselves have begun to shut down. From the top, the detectives with the blue light shirt is confused and stressed. His shoulders are tilted up, so he's feeling quite tense. He's covering his forehead with his hands as a means of self-pacifying behavior, slightly massaging his forehead and meanwhile unconsciously trying to break the influence of Israel Keys by his behavior of covering his eyes as if he wants to cut the cord or the way that Israel gets to him. However, notice that he is all disconnected from his notes of the interrogation in front of him as if he gave up, as if he submitted. The female detective has a need to embrace herself she is also doing this by chaining her fingers together, grounding herself and trying to protect her position in the room. Shoulders are tense and her brain is hopelessly searching for a means to an end, a way to cope with the situation. But look at how she's sitting, almost bowing down and her spine is not straight, as if she also submitted. The detective with a shirt on is also disconnected from his own notes. His arms are wrapped into each other. His shoulders tense tell us he is half closed to communication and the other half is listening to Israel. The way his chin is lifted towards Israel is an indication of his submission. So the real reason we chose the classroom analogy is because as Israel Keys found a way to break into these three detectives minds because Israel is leading them on with his questions towards the direction he wants and the detectives are answering his questions as there is a race of becoming the best student trying to beat each other to answer first. And when you spot this race, you will realize this is abnormal. But just because we made it obvious, don't let this lead you into thinking subconscious state changes or as a parent in real life. In the hurries of our stressful daily lives, none of us pay attention to our body language. What we have revealed is what's going on in the detectives' minds without their knowledge. 
yet they are still savoring their presence and extracting the information they need from Israel Keys. Now that we covered our psychology notes, let's look at the scene from the beginning. How long does a body last in a freshwater lake? I mean, because there's no critters that you it depends how it depends how lakes, right? Deep, I learned a lot. Because it depends on the deep, the temperature of the water. And if the body's contained in something. And if it's not critters, it can be like bacteria yeah. or even you know about Lake Crescent in Washington. Mm -hmm. How deep is it? I think that lake is five to seven hundred feet deep. They've really? never been to the bottom of it. There's people who have gone off that lake and they still haven't you know, their cars are in And that's the lake. That's one of the lakes. I don't know how deep it was. I know the general area. I had a fish finder, but it didn't register how deep it was. I just feel like it was over. Maxed out at 100 feet. Oh, is that your fish finder goes over? I think I don't remember. I just know if you've been to the lake, you would see what I'm talking about. It, it you know, drops down like a V. So. Dominance and power. That's what it's all about for a criminal with an abnormal brain. Curious to hear about his next move? Yeah, I thought so. It was March, and it would seem Israel Keys wanted another vacation. Not long after he dumped the remains of Samantha Koenig in the Matanuska Lake in Alaska, Israel Keys flew to Las Vegas, United States, rented a white Ford Focus, and used Samantha's car to withdraw money. He was unrecognizable near the ATMs. He rode to Arizona after his short trip to Vegas using the white Ford Focus rental car he had. Putting on a different outfit in order to disguise himself, he withdrew $400 from Samantha Koenig's bank account, which led to the beginning of the end for Israel Keys. The FBI was immediately notified of this transaction, and they started checking ATM cameras to spot Keys. As he was unrecognizable by the way he dressed, cameras were unable to capture his face or figure, but a security camera recorded his white Focus rental car. Even though the camera was unable to record the license plate of his rental car, it was enough to alert the Texas police and FBI once again. He withdrew more money from the same account of Samantha Koenig while he was in Texas. Again, the FBI and Texas authorities were alerted. The same car was then spotted parked in front of the Texas motel by a police officer who was monitoring the highway. The police officer suspected something was wrong and waited inside his car until Israel could be seen. He knew about Israel Keys and the search for the white Ford Focus rental. When Israel Keys left the Texas motel in his white Ford Focus, the officer followed him as he was driving over the speed limit. It was enough of a reason for the officer. He took the chance and pulled him over and asked him for his driver's license. Israel showed him his Alaskan license. Well, I was going to tell you that, but uh, we're, we're investigating the Alaskan license. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay. The officer knew that this was the guy they had been looking for. He immediately called for backup. Israel Keys was arrested and the police acquired a roll of bills, Samantha's debit card, a face mask that matched the ATM security camera in the Bank of Texas, Keys, a gun, and more. He denied everything and said nothing until March 31st, 2012. Meanwhile, the Koenig family was still looking for their beloved daughter, Samantha Koenig. He later on admitted that he abducted Samantha Koenig on February 8th from the Common Grounds espresso stand, and he had a condition to talk about the murders. Not only that, but he would give the details of his crime, if only the police would agree to keep the details from the press. He didn't want his little daughter to know anything about what he did to Samantha. Not an easy thing when you get everything through a middleman everywhere. So, um, you know, it's just not easy. Like I said, I don't know who to blame on right now. I'm pretty sure I know, but you know, it's I I was trying really hard to work with everybody on this, keep everybody happy, but I was, you don't know that pretty long time. So and I don't you know, I don't want this to turn into a Then admitted that Samantha was dead 
And he said, I'll tell you everything you want to know. I have lots more stories to tell. And he did. Police found the remains of Samantha Koenig in the Matanuska Lake, exactly where he said she was. Good evening, everyone. The massive search for missing barista Samantha Koenig is over, but it's not the news family and friends were hoping for. Anchorage police announced today they found a body they believe to be Samantha Koenig's in Matanuska Lake out in the valley. At Matanuska Lake Monday afternoon, a worst case scenario showed up just outside Kevin Sturgeon's house. I just thought people were ice fishing. That's all I thought. I had no idea intentions on what was going on. Rumors of a horrible development in the Samantha Koenig abduction became a lot more suspicious out in the Matanuska Valley. Kevin says snow machines started showing up. Just riding back and forth and hearing chainsaws. The discovery was then officially confirmed by the police. And all it took was the Anchorage Police Department Monday to make it official. Earlier today, a forensic dive team discovered in Matanuska Lake when investigators believed to be the body of Samantha Coney. It took until April 7th for the federal grand jury to press official charges against Israel Keys. The grand jury charged Israel Keys for kidnapping, receiving and possessing ransom money, access to vice fraud, and the death of Samantha Koenig. The indictment charges Keys, age 34, with three counts. First count is kidnapping, resulting in the death of Samantha Koenig. The second charge charges receiving and possessing ransom money. And the third count charges access to vice fraud. This is a first superseding indictment that replaces the original indictment against Israel Keyes. The indictment alleges that Israel Keyes abducted Samantha Koning from the Common Grounds coffee stand on Tudor Road on February 1st, 2012. And that he took her against her will to his white pickup truck that was parked across the street the allegations continue that he confined her and intentionally killed her early the next morning. The indictment also alleges that on the same night as the abduction, Keyes stole a debit card from a vehicle that Ms. Koenig shared that was parked near her residence, and that he further obtained the PIN number for that card from Samantha Koenig. Keyes then sent text messages from Samantha's cellular phone in an effort to conceal the abduction. The indictment further alleges that on February the 24th, Keyes sent a text message using Samantha's cellular telephone for the purpose of demanding that ransom money be placed in a bank account connected to the stolen debit card with the help of the reward money that was generously donated by members of this community the Koenig family was able to place money into the account and the indictment alleges that Keyes then used that stolen debit card to withdraw this ransom money from ATM machines here in Alaska in Arizona, in New Mexico, and in Texas. Law enforcement was able to track these ATM withdrawals. The crime of kidnapping and killing Samantha Koenig as charged in this indictment carries a maximum penalty of life or death. Meanwhile, Keyes was sure he wouldn't receive the death sentence. If I'm dead, then the investigation from the federal government's point of view is pretty much closed. However, as he was in court, he managed to break out of his leg restraints and tried to attack the judge. This uh, filed shortly after the court issued the order in this matter setting today's hearing. Our position is that at this particular juncture, we're not going to
Judge, can we go ahead and clear the courtroom? Can we go ahead and just clear the courtroom for now? Yeah. Okay. Make sure you get all your stuff. Officers quickly regain control of Israel Keys. All right. Now we're going to do that. I apologize. Um, uh, really, jumping here. And the first thing I got to say After finding out he was all over the news because of the Vermont couple he murdered, Israel changed his terms. He said he would only provide the rest of the information they need if he was immediately sentenced to death. I don't need to be punished for these other things that I haven't talked to you about yet because... You, you have to be honest with me. They're not gonna, they can't prosecute a dead man, so it's like, what? Right, but do you think anyone's going to really, do you think Vermont charges, say Vermont charges for the current, do you think they're really going to give you the death penalty knowing that there's more things out there? Do you think they're going to say, ah, you know, right, so so see, I know, I, you're I, in the catch 22, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're in the catch 22, and we're offering you, uh, you know, we're offering you what is the best bet. That's your call, buddy, but, you know, you're in a catch 22 because. Vermont U.S. Attorney's Office, Vermont State, isn't going to rush forward and give you what you want, knowing that there's more information. Yeah, right. They can't give you more information. Israel Keyes claimed to be two different people for the last 14 years of his life. One of them was a loving father, a boyfriend, a handyman, contractor, and a construction worker. And the other, an ice-cold serial killer, serial arsonist, bank robber, and abductor. There is no one who knows me or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. Mm -hmm. They know they're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kind of things I'm telling you, is me. How long have you been two different people? <laughs> long time. 14 years. On December 2nd, 2012, at 5.57 a.m., an officer walking next to his prison cell noticed a red streak on Israel's cell floor. Then he entered the cell. It was already too late. Israel keys his wrist and himself while in custody. He gave no numbers, figures, or places, or names of the people he has killed to that day. Next to his unconscious body, the officers found skulls that Keyes drew using his own blood. Next to the suicide note he left, the note was soaked in blood and barely legible. We don't know how many were victimized by Israel Keys to this day. He was officially pronounced dead on December 2nd, 2012. Even when he died, his message was simple. You may have me, but you can't control me. I'm the master of my own fate. And he confirmed this by his own quote he left in his prison cell, soaked in blood, but read as, you may have been free. You loved living your life. Fate had its own scheme, crushed like a bug. 
you still die. <laughs>